Thank you, Andy. That was really nice. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, and I really want to commend this morning's presentations. I thought you all did a really excellent job. Um, I'm now going to introduce the final speaker, Ralph Barrick, who is um, a person I really admire at the school. He's one of the most accomplished and prolific scientists anywhere, and he's really brought tremendous creativity, persistence, and innovation to the study of viruses. Um, I've had the opportunity to, um, uh, to tour his lab and on a couple of occasions, and it's just really impressive to see the way he and his team work together. And um, I'll just highlight a few of the things that are on the slide so we can get on to Ralph. Um, he's a professor of epidemiology in our school and um, microbiology and immunology in the School of Medicine. Like I've, uh, a number of the people who have spoken, you've, had, um, you've crossed schools, and I think that's really important. His lab specializes in coronaviruses and emerging infections like Zika viruses. Um, I, I'll just mention that the first time I was introduced to Ralph um, was at my first faculty meeting um, when I came to the School of Public Health after being at the NIH. And Bill Roper was dean at the time, and he talked about the fact that uh, the NIH had just called Ralph and offered him a big grant um, to study SARS. And um, having just been at the NIH, I knew how unusual that was, that somebody got called and offered a large grant. And uh, that told me a lot about Ralph, and I decided I wanted to meet him. And, uh, and everything I've learned about him subsequently has shown how impressive he is, what a quick study, and the importance of the work that he does. So Ralph is going to talk about um, how bad it, will, it could be and what we can do about it. So Ralph, thank you so much. How do I advance? Just this, right? All right, great. Thank you. Well, I have to admit I'm a little worried about giving this talk, um, partially because, um, as Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So uh, there's a good chance I could be wrong. Um, I study coronaviruses, noroviruses, flaviviruses, and uh, do some influenza, influenza virus research. Uh, just to give you some background of what I do. The other reason that I'm a little bit worried is uh, being labeled as a harbinger of doom. Um, this, is, this is not me. Uh, I'm not one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and I want you to let you know that I'm really kind of a nice guy. So <laughs> please come talk to me after this talk. Um, I will mention that viruses uh, are certainly in the pockets of all of the four horsemen, and they can be used in uh, all of these scenarios. Uh, so I'd like to start off by taking a step back and talk about how infectious diseases ranks or stacks up against other natural disasters that, uh, in terms of frequency and relative risk. So if you step back and uh, every three to 400 million years or so, uh, there's a danger of a gamma irradiation burst. These occur when black holes and neutron stars collide. Uh, it shoots out this uh, burst of gamma radiation, which can strip away the ozone layer, cause acid rain, result in high UV radiation levels to plant and animal life on the planet, can result in global warming. Uh, and this can occur as far as 6,500 light years away. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen so often, so I don't really lose sleep about this at night. A little bit more uh, likely to cause an issue is an astro asteroid strike. <clears throat> uh, the Earth runs into about 3,700 to, six, uh, to about uh, 7,800 tons of debris as it flows through space. Occasionally, some of these are big rocks. When a really big rock hits the planet, this can result in an extinction, extinction level event like what happened to the dinosaurs. The good news is that mammals became dominant, and so we are here today. Otherwise, we'd probably be lunch. Um, the, um, the U.S. takes this threat fairly seriously, so NASA has a near-Earth object program that tracks satellites that are large enough to cause damage to the planet. 
Uh, the one problem that they face is they can only track them for about 100 years and then the accuracy falls off. But fortunately, Bruce Willis from Armageddon is here. I just want to point out that he is also a Pensgrove boy. We actually went to school together. It's a little town in New Jersey, 3,500 of us, a clear epicenter of planetary defense. So uh, remember that, please. Uh, anyway, moving up on the list, we have supervolcanoes. These become a little more frequent. They're about every million years. Uh, these are volcanoes that are large enough to coat the uh, continent with about a half an inch of uh, ash or more. Uh, the last big one that went off was Tabu, um, which was in uh, Indonesia, resulted in an ice age and knocked the uh, human population down to about 10,000 individuals. There's about 20 of these of concern on the planet, and this is, this is ours. It's Yellowstone, obviously. Please go to the caldera and spend some time at that hotel. It's quite a treat. Finally, we have Carrington-level events, which probably some of you may have heard of. Most people have not. These are geomagnetic storms. So when solar flares throw off a lot of coronal mass, uh, they can hit our electromagnetic uh, um, waves that are around the Earth, and this can result in uh, uh, magnetic storms. And the biggest one occurred in 1859. There wasn't much electronics at the time but it caused fires in telegraph offices. It, it shocked or electrocuted uh, telegraph uh, workers. Uh, they, some uh, much smaller ones occurred in the 60s and the 70s that knocked out power grids in the US and Canada. Uh, Lloyds of London says that they can cause about $23 million, trillion dollars in damage and potentially knock out the power grid for one to five years. So this is not insignificant. And what's a little bit scary is that much larger flares are possible. Uh, so NASA has taken this pretty seriously, and there's the first solar probe that's going to go around the sun is going to be launched in, uh, in uh, this summer, and they are going to take a look at this. But this can certainly knock out GPS, cell phone, internet, and the power grid for several years. Okay, so now we're back into infectious diseases. Here we are. It's the number one threat, and, I'll tell, and uh, from my perspective, so since I've been on the planet, there's been an uh, epidemic virus every decade starting with Asian flu in 1957, Hong Kong in 1967 or 68. Uh, H1N1 came back in the 70s, followed by HIV, followed by West Nile, and then we got to the 21st century. And things sped up. SARS was the first uh, epidemic virus of the 21st century, about 8,000 cases in 33 countries with a 10% mortality. Chikungunya virus emerged around 2005 and sort of slowly spread across Asia to Polynesian islands and then arrived in the, in the Americas, where it caused a huge outbreak. Millions of people were involved in 2015. It's still here today. The Mexican flu in 2009 caused uh, 220,000 deaths worldwide. MERS coronavirus emerged in 2012. It's still around today with a 36% mortality and about 2,200 cases. About the same time, H7N9 emerged in uh, Southeast Asia with about 1,600 cases with 39% mortality. It's still around today, followed by Ebola with about 30,000 cases and a 39,000, a 39% mortality. And then Zika virus sort of drifted across Asia, ended up in Polynesia, and then arrived in the New World to cause another huge epidemic, pandemic with uh, the major complications being microcephaly and CS, CNS development problems in infants and developing children. So if you look at virus families, uh, clearly influenza, and coronaviruses and flaviviruses are the three most predominant groups that are causing problems in the 21st century, followed by alpha viruses. Because I predominantly study coronaviruses and hate being behind flu, uh, I include swine. And so there's four more big pandemics of swine. So clearly the most dangerous viruses on the planet are coronaviruses. I had to say that, Adolfo. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but I'm a coronavirologist, and so I'm not talking about flu. <laughs> yeah. Did I mention I, am, I have high insecurity levels about flu virology? <laughs> I feel like a second-class citizen now. Um, so uh, based on that data, I think it's clearly number one. If you don't believe me, you can believe Bill Gates. Uh, he, he clearly thinks that uh, 10 million people could easily be killed in the next decade or so from infectious diseases. So things like SARS disappeared after 2004, Ebola uh, disappeared, uh, Zika virus has almost disappeared. So are these viruses actually extinct or are they just hiding? 
We've actually asked that question with SARS. These are, uh, again, between 2002, 2004. These are the viruses associated with the expanding SARS epidemic. Uh, most of them are gone. In fact, all of them are gone. We can't find these viruses anymore. But when you sequence bats, these are horseshoe bats, and this is a bat that wants to bite whoever's handling it, um, you find all sorts of SARS-like viruses. In fact, these are uh, up to 97% identical to these epidemic strains that caused human disease. So are they, uh, uh, do they have pre-pandemic potential? So that's the question that we were interested in. And so um, what we did was this spike, like a protein gene right here, mediates species specificity. You can actually remove that spike gene from these epidemic strains and put in these bat spike genes in, in place of them. This was done by Vineet Manachari and uh, other people in the lab. And uh, of the five that we dropped in, being almost identical to very, very different, three of these could actually replicate just fine and use human receptors for entry. If you took hum primary human airway epithelial cells, those are cells that are removed from uh, the conducting airways from transplant recipients, the lung they gave up, not the lung they received. So they take on the architecture of the human lung. SARS loves to replicate in these little cells that have cilia sticking out of them, and these viruses grow in those cells as well as the epidemic strains. And you can do a variety of experiments to try to get an idea of their pre-pandemic potential. So they replicate in the right cells, and they replicate exceptionally well. Uh, if this mouth, if the parental strain is virulent, and you drop these bat strain genes in, they attenuate virulence. So that's good news. But if you take a mouse that has the human receptor in it instead of the mouse receptor, these viruses are lethal. So they clearly have the potential to cause lethal disease. If you take vaccines against SARS that work against SARS, they don't work against these variants that are sitting in the animal pools, the zoonotic pools, and therapeutic antibodies that are present that work against SARS don't work as well against the more distant strains. So the answer is there's still lots of pre-epidemic viruses around. This is the SARS story, but you can go to flu or any other virus that has emerging potential that pops up, causes an outbreak, and then disappears. It's still here. They don't go extinct. Um, they are waiting to return. In fact, uh, people that live around the, the caves where these bats hang out with these viruses actually are seropositive, and several of them have, many of them who are seropositive have neutralizing antibodies. So they're being exposed. The virus is spilling over. It will happen again. So we can go to our panicometer. Now, this is an important thing. Um, what kind of person will you see on the news that will raise your tension level and cause panic? Now, this is by field, so uh, clearly these guys don't cause much panic. But down at this end, as you can tell, astronomers, volcano uh, volcanologists, and virologists are the ones that cause all the panic on TV. So I think the virologists can probably do better. Uh, I think the astronomers are doing a better job of scaring people than the virologists are doing. But uh, virologists, actually, uh, there is a real threat. <clears throat> so can we learn anything about past and current pandemics in terms of their severity to give us an idea of how bad the next one can be? Let's, let's look historically. Well, we have the Black Death. 75 million people in Europe over about a 300, 400 year period of time. The Spanish flu that we're talking about today with 50 to 100 million deaths. HIV AIDS in 37 years has killed a million people plus a year. 35 million are infected, devastating disease. Um, smallpox uh, during the Antonian plague, I think this was during the Byzantine Empire, 20 to 30% mortality. In adults, 80% of the children died. In fact, although it's rarely mentioned, smallpox killed more people in the 20th century than any other pathogen, 300 to 500 million before it was eradicated. One of the greatest public health success stories in the history of the planet. <clears throat> TB, 1.3 to 1.7 million deaths per year. Asian flu, 2 million deaths. Typhus, uh, this is during, right after World War I in Russia, 3 million deaths. This is just one example, there are more. You can go to malaria, which kills about a half a million people per year. And then there's the gastrointestinal viruses. I usually try to show a video of uh, Victor, uh, Victoria Falls. Imagine the water flowing over that for 30 to 45 seconds, and you have an idea how much diarrhea is on the planet. Yeah, but it, it's a little squeamish before lunch. 
But in reality, one out of nine children die from diarrheal disease, and this is a tragedy. <clears throat> when uh, naive populations come into contact with new pathogens, the results can be devastating. Uh, in the New World, when Columbus and Cortez came, they brought smallpox, flu, and measles. Uh, for example, there were about 250,000 natives in Hispaniola when Columbus first arrived. Within about 50 years, 95% of them were dead. Uh, in general, 90%, some argue as much as 90% of the native Indian populations on the North and South American continents and Central America died from the 30 plus pathogens that came over with the colonists. That's pretty tragic. <clears throat> Let's not just think about humans when you think about the potential for catast catastrophic events. Food production is critical. Fungal pathogens, largely ignored, have caused about 70% of the global and regional extinctions. The best one in, in my uh, mind is the chestnut tree blight, which killed two billion chestnut trees. Food crops, there's lots of food crop pathogens that attack potato, rice, corn, wheat, and soybean. In fact, the, um, the blight on the potato crop in Ireland resulted in about a million deaths from starvation. Uh, it's a little bit of a concern that this wheat stem rust super strain called UG99, which uh, emerged in Uganda, has been slowly making its way into the Middle East, approaching these big wheat growing areas. Uh, this strain will kill 80 to 100% of the 90% types of wheat that are grown on the planet. Uh, of the 700 million tons of product that are used to feed 4.5 billion and making up 20 to 30 percent of their diet, we could lose 90 percent of that. GMO is most likely the solution, and that irritates people. Sorry. And then there's swine pathogens, because I wanted to document that coronaviruses like to kill pigs. It's just not fair. <laughs> Porcine epidemic diarrhea virus in about 20 years has killed over a billion pigs on the planet. So pathogens can cause a tremendous amount of disease despite the best farming practices that exist. This swept across the US and killed a dozen, uh, tens of millions of pigs. Okay, and so rather than having uh, trucks or train loads of human bodies, you get the idea. Okay, this, is, this is, can happen. What are the pandemic, pandemic drivers? Um, EcoHealth has mapped the hotspots for virus emergence. These are shown here. As it gets um, more inflamed, yeah, there is more evidence of uh, virus uh, spread into human populations. This is supported by human growth in terms of population growth, but really probably the most important thing is population density, which is shown here. And you can overlay these population density maps right on top of these grids, which are associated with pandemic outbreaks. So it's not only the interface between humans and wildlife, population density allows for increased and more efficient transmission. That leads to increased virulence. And then the aging population. We're getting a lot older. I'm happy about that. However, several pathogens like flu, coronas, noros, flavies, RSV, et cetera, cause much more increased pathogenesis and, virulent, and are much more virulent in the aged population. I don't want to stigmatize any group, especially a group that I'm now in, but I want to show you an example of this using mice's models. And so imagine each transmission wave going from one person to the next. You can mimic that in the, in the, in the uh, laboratory by having young mice and having old mice and comparing the effect of virus transmission, a non-pathogenic virus, being transmitted in these animals. After about 15 to 20 passages, these mice will be dead. The virus will become lethal in a young animal. In an old animal, it takes five to six passages. When you sequence these viruses, six to 10 mutations are critical for disease emergence in the young animals. One to two mutations in the old animals. There are patterns of change that you can see in the young animals that have to occur. In the older animals, and these are six different replicates here, there's no pattern. There are many pathways to increased virulence in a compromised, immune compromised population. If you attenuate this virus even further, so it should be harder, 
the virus figures out the strategy. It deletes a gene and it becomes more virulent. So viruses have many tricks up their sleeve to enhance virulence. Now the good news is that these viruses that are killing the older animals, if you put them back in the young animals, they don't kill them. So it's population control, I guess, at its worst. <clears throat> and so these factors all merge together to produce maps like this. We've all seen it. There are emerging viruses that are occurring all over the planet in addition to flu. And uh, this, is, this, uh, this scenario is likely not to change anytime soon in the 21st century. Okay, so I wanted to give one other example about the effect of travel. Imagine an outbreak occurring in Hong Kong or Southeast Asia. It takes about two months to arrive in rural North Carolina. Uh, David Weber, I actually got these slides from David, and I saw that he showed them. So this was SARS in June, where we were uh, setting up a, a triage unit to look at uh, individuals who had been exposed to the SARS case. But this is not an isolated story. When MERS emerged, this occurred at, at Indiana University. We have Ebola case occurring at Dallas. And so there are really no places to hide from emerging pathogens. And they're basically about 24 hours away. And so we have to think globally rather than locally. OK, so how much worse could it be? Well, I like this quote. Uh, this is from a U.S. Army physician. It's one of the most powerful letters I've ever read. It's in the National Academy, a report about pandemic flu. Uh, he's writing his father about uh, treating cases during the flu pandemic. I don't have time to read it. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, the, the data suggests that it can be a lot worse. <clears throat> so um, if you were going to pressure me to say which flu strain was the worst, and I wasn't allowed to say coronaviruses. <laughs> uh, my, guess, uh, my best guess would be an H2 virus or an H7 virus, or like H7 and 9. I'll talk about H2 first. Uh, H2 has been in the human population in 1859 and then again in 1957. Uh, it has caused uh, high mortality rates. Uh, it disappeared in 1968. This is a hemagglutinin gene that uh, can function well in humans. Uh, it, anyone under the age of 51 has never seen it, so there's very little herd immunity. In essence, the same scenario now exists that exists in 1981 with H2 virus instead of H1 virus. If you're old, you're going to do well. If you're young, you're in trouble. So yay for the age people, finally. <laughs> However, <clears throat> H7 and 9 is a much different story. None of us have any pre-existing immunity. We are all at risk. And so what does the data suggest? Well, the numbers can be pretty horrifying in the absence of any intervention. So if you look at an attack rate during a flu pandemic, which ranges from about 20 to 38%, some people say 10%, others say 50%. That's sort of the range that can occur in terms of the attack rate. If you look at the mortality rate, uh, 0.1 to 60%, this is generous in my opinion. But that's what has been reported in the literature, so you can use it as the top rate. <clears throat> and the reason I mention it's generous is because asymptomatic infections probably don't get calculated in this H5N1 mortality rate. And there's this other factor, which there is an inverse relationship in general between transmission efficiency and virulence. In other words, if you have someone who's infected and dies quickly, they don't transmit. Having said that, HIV figured out a way around that, didn't it? It kills slowly, allowing for a longer transmission window. So it's not necessarily true that this will occur, and it's also influenced by population density. So when you start doing the math using the lower numbers, you end up with 1.68 million deaths out of 7 billion individuals. If you use the higher numbers, it's 1.6 billion. That's the range you're looking at. Let's take a 1918 uh, flu-like virus with about a 4% mortality. You're looking at about 106 million deaths. In the US, that would uh, equate to about 12 million deaths. Uh, a flu strain that had a 10% mortality rate, that's about what SARS had, and it was pretty fair, fairly efficiently transmitted, so it's likely. You'd be looking at about 266 million deaths. In the US, it would be 30 million deaths. An H7N9 virus with a 39% mortality is a billion individuals. 
Again, this is unlikely to keep this high rate, but it could be 10 to 20 percent or less. H5N1 would be 1.6 billion. So those are pretty horrible numbers. You can modify that a little bit if you think about treatment with drugs. That would reduce both the attack rate and the mortality rate. I'm guessing at these numbers. I gave it a half, uh, uh, a reduction in the disease uh, mortality rate by half each. So this would reduce these numbers by about a quarter, 400,000 to about 4 million, 100 million deaths. Surprisingly, uh, and I might be wrong about this, but everything that I read in the literature said that treatment of secondary bacterial infections really show very little improvement in uh, flu-infected individuals. And so it really has very little impact on the overall mortality rates. I'll, give, I'll show you a reason why that might be the case. So that's not really going to help. I didn't talk about other barriers to infection. That's certainly going to help. But those are the numbers you're looking at. In terms of our uh, stockpile, I think we've had somewhere between 50 and 100 million doses of Tamiflu. That certainly will uh, help quite a bit in the first wave. Okay, what about the efficacy of antiviral drugs? Well, these emerging coronaviruses and flu viruses cause this disease called acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is your alveoli. You're transmitting oxygen very efficiently to the red blood cells and the capillary bed that surround it. What do these viruses do? They love this cell right here. They kill it. This cell supports these two cells. Some of these viruses, like MERS, also infects these cells, either called type 1 cells. And this barrier that prevents fluid from coming across this capillary bed into the alveoli is broken down. In addition, inflammatory cells come in and dump lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which cause more damage. And so these alveoli fill up with fluid. So when you think about the description of the story of Ben and Thomas Wolfe's novel, you're now looking inside to see what exactly happened to his lung. He was drowning in his own fluid. Now, uh, if this is bad enough, you have hemorrhage, lots of red blood cells pouring into here as well. What happens when you hemorrhage? You try to clot and wall off that bleeding, and that's exactly what you do in your lung. And you lay down these big clots, which are, uh, look like high, they're called hyaline membranes. They have lots of clotting factors in them and cellular debris. So you're building a wall to prevent this fluid coming out. And then you have efflux pumps that pump the fluid back out, opening up the airway. Problem is, is that is a thick, gooey barrier. Oxygen can't transfer across, so now you're suffocating. This is a devastating end-stage lung disease. It's been difficult to clinically manage for many, many years. And there are no real treatments besides, besides NIH spending millions of dollars. So what happens, uh, so I wanted to mention that this is both a virus and an host immunopathologic disease. <clears throat> and so you have to treat both, but of all of our antivirals only attack the virus, not the host response. So you're only getting half of the disease. So this is what happens in flu, also in coronaviruses. You have mock-treated animals with no drug. OK, they all die. They get sick or die. If you treat with a drug that works against a virus like MERS or SARS and you give it before infection or one day after infection, these guys get mild disease and do well, but at day two or beyond, they die. That means the virus has already hit its peak titer. The program leading to immune pathologic mediated death has been set, and you can't stop it even if you knock down virus. So a highly pathogenic flu virus that limits that therapeutic window is going to result in more death. Less pathogenic one that opens that window up will make drugs more effective. So it's hard to predict what will happen. Vaccine availability, if we don't, if Barney doesn't make the universal flu, which uh, his data looks great, uh, we're limited to uh, traditional methods. That's four to eight months. Uh, seed stocks will be ready in a few days. Uh, if we use reverse genetics, if we use reassortment, that was developed in the 50s and the 60s. It takes a little bit longer. But uh, we can develop the seed stocks incredibly quickly. The bottlenecks are egg production. And then um, you have to put the uh, surface proteins of the virus into a backbone that grows well in eggs. And sometimes that match doesn't work. Like during the 2009 pandemic, it doesn't grow as well. You make less vaccine, and so now the vaccine is in limited quantities. <clears throat> So you miss the epidemic wave for most people. The other problem that can occur is egg ad adaptation. The virus could adapt to the egg. And in the mutation from growing in the egg could actually be the juicy epitope that your immune system responds to. 
So you don't make a good immune response against the pathogen. Uh, so that's the other problem. And then you have the anti-vaccine advocates. We don't need to go into them. Something truly novel uh, can be difficult, like HIV. I had no idea HIV-like viruses could exist in 1980. SARS coronavirus, no, coronaviruses were on no one's list as potential high path viruses. These can take months to years to decades to develop and using current technologies. I think the newest technologies will, will uh, drop that quite a bit. Um, but this is also then complicated by vaccine induced immune pathology, vaccine induced enhancement or antigenic variation. They're, they're tough nuts to crack. Let's move on to social issues. Um, and talk about um, how society responds. So in 1918, this is uh, infant mortality rate per 1,000 people. You can uh, superimpose on this graph the mortality rate for adult men and women or uh, pregnant women in that there was high mortality in 1918, 1915, uh, and it's now very low. So in other words, people in this time period were quite familiar with death. It was a part of life. We now live in, uh, to some extent, a sterile environment. The people who are alive today have no appreciation for the uh, disease severity that existed, that can exist in populations. Go to any uh, farm homestead and look at the cemetery and look at the number of five-year-olds, kids under the age of five that died, and the number of wives that the farmer had, probably because of death during pregnancy. So we have no frame of reference for this. The scale is beyond our comprehension. Uh, many people are likely not going to respond and be at their best in this sort of environment. That's a, a more positive way to say uh, things could be horrible. The vast majority of nations are not prepared. In reality, six are prepared, including the U.S. The rest are in various stages of uh, conceptual development to no development to partial development. So the U.S. is, is well placed to respond, uh, but the rest of the world isn't. And that means that the global economy is going to suffer because it's going to collapse in other countries. This is going to either collapse or be in shambles. There's going to be shortages with very little infrastructure in inequities, uh, inequalities in terms of health care. Yes, physicians will have to make difficult decisions about who gets care, who lives, and who dies. That's bad news. What about the market? I want to give you some good news eventually. So um, in 1918, uh, that outbreak had very little effect on the Dow and the S&P 500. It dropped initially about 24% in 1918, but rebounded in 1919. The UK equity market was uh, in a bull market both years. I think to some extent that was due to World War I. There was such high death, especially for the, Briti the British in that war, that they were so glad the war was over. They were very happy. During the SARS epidemic, very different thing. Uh, commercial airlines lost billions of dollars. In fact, there was a 54, 54 billion economic loss during the outbreak. <clears throat> oh, yes, there it is. Uh, during the Ebola outbreak, there was about an 8 to 10 percent drop in the market. It then quickly recovered. I wanted to give you good news. You can, there are winners out there, right? So if you're looking at, if you want to be prepared and make money in the next pandemic, if, that, if that's what you want to do. Buy stock in hazmat suit makers and protective clothing or, vi or companies that make antiviral drugs of that particular pandemic. You'll probably do pretty well. There are actually uh, mutual funds for pandemic preparedness. You can bet on anything in this country. <laughs> Some products do well. 1918, including masks, same thing today. Uh, pandemics really are uh, times of opportunity, and I like George R.R. R. Martin's quote of chaos as a ladder. Um, there is an opportunity for people to have political gain, financial gain, and personal gain during times of social upheaval, and that will probably occur. There will be misleading stories on social media, miracle cures that will be touted, conspiracy theories. One thing that uh, is kind of new you could probably buy and order your own vaccine on the internet for about 200 bucks now. So you can buy your own vaccine and probably vaccinate yourself. Um, if you have a little bit of knowledge and most likely somebody will come up with a scheme to sell that in a safe, in a, in a legal way, not a safe way. Uh, the scientific community may run into all sorts of ethical dilemmas. Uh, at UNC, there's at least a dozen 
uh, faculty who can have experimental vaccines already within two weeks. There's other groups that will have, uh, be able to test drugs for ability to inhibit virus replication in cell culture that will be done within a month. And those will get published. There'll be lots of hype. There'll be news reports. None of it's FDA approved. None of it's truly safe. But if, it's, if you're dealing with a 10 to 20% mortality rate, people are going to want to take it. And that leaves all kinds of ethical dilemmas around the concept of what would you do to protect those who you love. And also universities may get hounded uh, with riots in terms of hoarding drugs and vaccines that could protect the public. So what can we do? Uh, these have been covered in this session. Leaders and health professionals have to retain their credibility, speak in a unified voice, and tell the truth. Uh, this is absolutely essential. Uncertainty will lead the public to look for an answer, and there will be plenty of people out there willing to provide answers that will be for their own gain. We live in an interconnected world. This is not a local problem. It's a global problem. We can't ignore the rest of the world. We have to think about poverty, public health, uh, infrastructure, and uh, trying to help up those who are not as uh, well off as we are. The concept of One Health is important, and I think we have to recognize that pandemics are inevitable. Finally, um, I know I ran over, I think we have to think about scalability plans and surge capacity. David gave a great talk about UNC's preparedness. I think the bigger question in the other 5,260 plus hospitals or so in the United States, are they equally as ready? I don't know the answer to that question. I hope the answer is yes. Most likely it's not. Uh, we, have to have the, we have stockpiled drugs, medical supplies, and deployable medical facilities and beds. Uh, I'm not sure how well the logistics will work to move that around in, in the face of a large pandemic. And I think uh, it's absolutely critical to continue to support basic and applied research and to embrace new technologies. I think Barney uh, and both Adolfo and Yoshi all gave uh, state-of-the-art talks talking about the latest developments that are, that are available that can be applied to rapid vaccine design. And these are listed here. I don't want to really run through them. But in terms of diagnostics, therapeutics and, and vaccines, uh, we really are at a peak in terms of a, the, the a revolutionary capacity to respond more quickly than we have ever had before. This is not 1918. We have uh, much more powerful uh, things on our uh, 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 techniques available at our disposal that allow for rapid response, which would save lives. And with that, I thank you for your attention.